not looking for our religious activities. He's looking for your heart. We may be in the right place, but where is our heart? He is after our temple because God's presence lives there. It matters to him. I mean, can you imagine what would happen on this campus if we each started walking around like we actually house the temple? We actually house the spirit of God. What would happen if we started to not make each other the enemy and we actually focus on the real enemy? And we started to pay attention and say, we are the temple of God together. Hope you guys had a great spring break. Why don't you guys stand to your feet? We're going to worship together this morning. Put your hands together like this. I saw Satan fall like lightning. And I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders And I have resurrection power But still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony.
from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story So I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony Good morning. Welcome back from spring break. Yeah, I know some are still traveling back. I know most of the classes start tomorrow and Wednesday, but thank you for being here. I'm glad you got back a little early so you could be in chapel this morning. So next week, our speaker is going to be Eric Nelson, who's the director of spiritual life. So Eric, next week he's on. I don't know where he's sitting, but he's out here somewhere. Uh, today, our speaker is Glenn Packiam. Glenn is uh, one of the teaching pastors at New Life Church in Colorado Springs. And if you've never heard Glenn, I think you're going to really be blessed this morning. So thank you for being here. Before the band comes back to lead us in a song or two, let me uh, share this scripture with you. It says in Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Amen? Amen. Let's sing together.
destined to die poured out for all mankind God's only son the perfect and spotless one he never sinned but suffered as if he
thank you, Jesus. Thank you because you are good, because we're secure and certain in your promises. We see a victory, and we will overcome by your blood, by the power of your name. We thank you for another week, another day, another moment in your presence. We're grateful for you, God. In your name we pray, amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? I just want to thank the worship team for leading us. That was a powerful time of worship and the presence of God. Thank you all for that. I was telling them in the back room there just before we began today that I, I think what we need to recognize is that they're developing and cultivating a deep life with God, and that's what spills out into all of us. So there's such, I have such gratitude. I began my ministry um, in a local church as a worship leader, so I always love, love, love getting to interact and, and experience a wonderful worship. Great to be with you at Grand Canyon University this morning. Uh, this has been a long time coming for me. Uh, Pastor Tim and I were joking about this. I was supposed to come, I think it might have been nine or ten years ago, and uh, I got real sick. I'd just come back from an international trip and had to cancel very, very late uh, notice, and so I thought, they're never going to have me back, but here I am. Uh, enough time has passed, the statutes of limitations or whatever, and I'm I'm back. It's great to be with all of you. Uh, my name's Glenn Packiam. I, I live in Colorado Springs. I've been there for about 22 years. But I am originally from Malaysia, so I just want to tell you a little bit about my, uh, my family background, my story. I grew up in Malaysia. My dad was raised in a Hindu family. My mom was raised in a Christian family. Uh, they met at the University of Singapore. They started dating. She was like, I'm not going to marry a Hindu. He was like, great, I'll convert to Christianity. Most successful dating as evangelism strategy ever. No, we don't recommend that. And of course, there's more to the story than that. Um, but I grew up, you know, by the time I my sister and I came along, grew up in a Christian home. When I was 10, we moved from Malaysia to America. We, we lived in Portland, Oregon for about three years. My parents went to Bible school there. And then we moved back to uh, Malaysia, finished up my high school years. And then I came back to the States to go to college in the late 90s. Yes, I know. It puts me up there in age. And around my junior year, I met this girl. And, uh, I, you know, I was talking to someone today who was telling me that he's engaged and all this stuff. So sometimes that happens, right? It doesn't have to happen, but sometimes that happens. But in my junior year, I met this girl, and I didn't really think we had a chance because I, I looked at her, and she had these blonde highlights and blue eyes and tan skin. And what did I know? I was watching American TV in Malaysia, you know? So I was like, she's probably a cheerleader from California. She looked at me like I had, like, the really, really short hair, gold rim glasses, argyle sweaters before argyle was cool the second time. And... Uh, uh, and she thought, this is probably like some sweet, nerdy foreign student guy. And uh, I came to find out she was really a farm girl from Iowa. Uh, she came to find out that I was really a sweet, nerdy foreign student guy. But somehow we ended up uh, together. And this summer will be 21 years of marriage. I want to show you. Yay! <laughs> so I just want to show you a quick little family picture. There's our crew. Uh, that's my wife, Holly. Sophia on the far left is our oldest. She's a junior in high school. Uh, Nora is a freshman. Jonas is in sixth grade. And Jane is in third grade. There you go. Now we're friends. You've seen family photos. I won't show you vacation photos or anything like that. Hey, let's pray before we open up the scriptures. Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for how you're at work this morning already in our hearts and in our lives. We pray that as we open the scriptures that you would speak to us. You would call something awake in us today. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. About a year ago, I read this story that there was an engineer on a supply ship who was feeling dizzy in the middle of the night, and he went up uh, to the upper deck to kind of get some air. And this is somewhere in the ocean around New Zealand, but really kind of in the middle of nowhere. And he disappeared. And it was early the next morning that his son was like, where'd my dad go? And they figured out that he had fallen overboard in the middle of the ocean and the waves were swelling and the tides were going up and down and they were trying to backtrack and figure out maybe he fell overboard around 4 a.m. and so they're trying to figure out where were we and it had been hours and hours of, and hours of him missing in the ocean. And they had no hope, like, are we actually going to find him? And finally, the search ship was going by the area, and they saw this hand kind of bobbing up and down out of the waters. And it was this dude, this engineer had, had survived, and the 
reason he had survived is shortly after falling overboard, he found a speck in the horizon. He saw this little, little object off in the distance, and he started swimming toward it, and it turned out that that speck was an abandoned buoy, and he grabbed onto it and was floating and floating for hours. That was the thing that saved him. And when I heard that story, I thought, boy, this is kind of a picture of maybe our lives the last couple of years. Some of you, you didn't plan on your college experience coinciding with the pandemic. <laughs> you didn't plan on the disruption to your classes and to your schedules or whatever the different uh, things that you've experienced that have been disorienting. And somehow it's felt maybe like you're in the middle of an ocean and you're not sure what's around you and what's going to happen or what's next or how, how things are going to turn out. And if it, you're looking for something on the horizon. Can I swim toward that? What's that fixed point? What's the thing I can move toward? Or maybe you're, you found it and you're like, I'm just clinging to this and I'm holding on for dear life. I think in many ways, actually in a very real way, the thing that we're all clinging to is to Jesus himself. The one that we're clinging to, the one that we're hanging on to in the midst of the turbulence and the waves and the turmoil, we know that it, if it isn't Jesus, we at least know somewhere inside that it should be. But the question oftentimes is how? How in our spiritual lives, how in our lives do we orient our hearts toward God? How in the midst of everything that's going on do we say, God, where are you? Where's the fixed point on the horizon? Where's the one that can keep me afloat? And maybe it's too big of a question that you're like, I've got enough. i got finals. i got projects. i got trips. i got stuff, summer plans. How in the world do I stop to figure out how my life can orient in a Godward direction? Obviously, that's a question that your team here at GCU, the spiritual life team, is going to, has been spending weeks and weeks helping you along the way. And this morning, I want to be a piece of that and talk to you about prayer. And I want to talk to you about three kinds of prayer. Sometimes we imagine that prayer is the sort of extra credit thing that we're supposed to do. And prayer is like, well, you know, if I have time, I'll get to that. But otherwise, I've got to just get on with my life and do stuff. In fact, even when a tragedy happens or we look at what's happening in Europe right now in Ukraine and we think, well, pray, okay, but, but what does prayer actually do? And so prayer becomes peripheral or it becomes extra credit or it becomes optional and maybe if I have time, instead of prayer being the very means by which we cling to God himself. Instead of prayer becoming your essential life support, the only way that you'll survive in this ocean is by this lifeline to God. And I want us to look very briefly this morning at Psalm 13. If you've got a Bible, great. If not, we, we'll have it on the screen. But I want to talk to you about three kinds of prayer, protest, petition, and praise. And they all show up in Psalm 13. Protest, petition, and praise, and they all show up here. Psalm 13, verse 1 and 2, it says, How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? This first kind of prayer is what we'll call protest. Protest. The kind of prayer that says, come on, God, how long? I find that actually this is the kind of prayer that we want to pray but don't know that we can. This is the kind of prayer that comes from the gut, from the depths of our being, but we're not sure because it's not churchy prayers. It's not the kind of prayer that probably if you've been in church on a Sunday morning, it's not typically the kind of prayer that someone comes up on the platform and says, okay, sister so-and-so is going to pray this morning. She goes, oh, why, God? You're like, oh, that was awkward. Could someone please usher her off the stage? And so we don't see it modeled. We don't see people pray like this, but the scriptures are full of prayers like this. In fact, the Psalms are the prayer book of the people of God, and not just for the people of God in the Old Testament, but Christians for 2,000 years have been praying the Psalms. In the early centuries, the early Christians said, the Psalms are like a gymnasium for the soul. They're how you work out your spiritual life. If you're like, well, yeah, you know, this is what I do to keep fit, this is what I do to work out or whatever, you know, great. How do I work out my inner life? The early Christians said, the Psalms, 
Pray these psalms because it teaches you to be in touch with the different uh, parts of your life and to bring them before God. But the, the one that we sort of forget about or maybe that we don't know that we have permission to do is this language of protest. What do you do when you see something wrong in the world? What do you do when you recognize injustice, unrighteousness, wickedness? What do you do when you see suffering and pain? What do we say when we watch bombs falling on hospitals in Ukraine? Is there language for that kind of prayer? The prayer of protest is actually a form of prayer because it bears witness to a greater reality. It's saying, God, you didn't make the world to be like this. This is not the way you, you saw things when you stood back in Genesis 1 and said, that's good. Protest allows you to call evil, evil, and good, good. The prayer of protest allows us to say, God, this doesn't align with who I know you to be. This doesn't line up with who, with who I think you are. But protest is also a form of prayer because of who it's directed to. H have you ever had like a really frustrating customer experience phone call? I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're on hold. The other day I had a problem with my daughter's MacBook. I'm on hold. Apple was amazing. But there's sometimes some other companies, we won't mention names, you get on hold and you're like, and they're like, I'm sorry, I can't help you, you know, whatever. And it, after like an hour or whatever of being on hold and talking to a person to, only to hear, I'm sorry, I can't help you, the thing that you want to say is what? Excuse me, can I just talk to your manager, please? Can I talk to the supervisor? And what you're doing is you're saying, I need to take my complaint one level higher because if you don't do, if you can't do anything, I need to talk to someone who can. Here's why our protest is a form of prayer. It's because it's taken up with the highest power there is. The problem with us is when we don't pray our protest, our protest will leak out to the people who can't actually do anything about it. And so you, li you live your life kind of murmuring and complaining and cynical and skeptical and <laughs> you're making fun of things here and there because you, you, don't, you, don't, you recognize that something's wrong with the world, but you don't know what to do with it, so it just leaks out in cynicism. And I want to say to you, take that sense of this is wrong and turn it into prayer. Take it to the one who is sovereign. Take it to the one who is on the throne. Take it to the God who is not only sovereign, but also good. I mean, what if you took your complaint to the highest level, the manager, and they're like, yeah, I see what you're saying. I can totally make it right, but I don't want to. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, that's, that's, you're, you're not a good manager. <laughs> and this is why as Christians, we don't just say God is sovereign. We say God is good. And when we take our protest to him, it matters. Maybe it's helpful to think of it this way. The language of protest teaches us to say, it should not be this way. It should not be this way. If you've ever felt that about something that you're experiencing or something that you're observing, turn it into a prayer and say, God, it should not be this way. As we keep reading in Psalm 13, we find another kind of prayer. Psalm 13, verse 3, the psalmist goes on. He says, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Now the psalmist is not just protesting. He's not saying, How long? Now he's asking for something. And the second kind of prayer in Psalm 13 is the prayer of petition. It's petition. It's the idea of asking God for something. I, as you saw, I have four kids, and um, I've realized that they're, they're amazing kids, but they're definitely bolder around uh, my wife and I than they are with other people. You know, like, like yesterday, I was in church, and in between services, I'm talking to people in the lobby and all that stuff, and my youngest comes up to me, and she's like, Dad, I need to ask you a question. I'm like, well, it's so urgent, you know? And she's like, I need to know if I can watch a movie this afternoon. <laughs> I'm like, honey, we, we don't have to talk about this right now. Like, I will be home in a couple hours. But our kids, they have this boldness. They'll just come to you and ask you stuff. In fact, when we were, we were planning New Life downtown, this congregation of New Life Church uh, about 10 years ago, 
I was, I was preaching, and I was, you know, down on the floor preaching, and it's kind of this sloped uh, high school auditorium, and all of a sudden, in the middle of my sermon, my oldest, who was, you know, who then was like, I don't know, seven or eight, she comes down the aisle and sits right in the chair in front of me and looks at me, and I'm like, uh-oh, what's happening? And my wife, you know, we just had our, our fourth child was a baby, so my wife's probably out with the baby somewhere, and our oldest is, and she's like, and this is not, I mean, it's a high school auditorium, old, squeaky, and you can hear everything, you know. So I'm trying to ignore her. I'm trying to do like the preachers. I'm just going, oh, yes, and the Lord says, you know. And, and she's like, psst. She starts waving at me, you know. I'm like, okay, at this point, everybody hears you. So, Sophia, what's up? What's up? You know, she's like, Jonas can't find his blankie. I'm like, yes, that is a true emergency. You may interrupt church to help me help you. My point is that kids don't, and actually we raise our kids to have that kind of boldness because it's better than children believing that I can't ask my parents anything because they don't care. It's better than the, the other option of saying, well, I'm not going to talk to them about anything because they don't care about me. But this is what happens with us and God. If you've stopped praying this year, maybe it's because you've stopped believing that God actually cares. My friend Russell Moore tells the story of years ago visiting an orphanage in Russia where his boys are from and he said the most eerie sound in this orphanage of babies was the sound of silence. You think about this, the sound of silence. Babies in cribs not crying. Why? Because they realized that nobody would come. Babies are supposed to cry. They're supposed to cry because uh, uh, their cry shows that there's someone who's attached to them, someone who cares for them, someone who will respond to them. But the sound of silence in a room full of babies is eerie because these babies have given up. You realize, what's the point? And I wonder sometimes in our churches if the sound of silence is the sound of people who've given up believing that God cares. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're here and you're like, I honestly, Glenn, like prayer. I don't, I, don't, I don't even bring petitions to God anymore because I'm not sure he cares. Petition is an expression of our confidence in God's care. Maybe we can say it this way, that the language of petition teaches us to say, come and make a way. If protest says it should not be this way, petition is saying, God, come and make a way. Like we were singing this morning, come and make a way where there is no way. Come and do this. Come and bring a victory. Come and take what the enemy meant for evil in my life, in their life, in our world today. Come, Lord, make a way. Psalm 13 is such an amazingly, brilliantly compact psalm because it has a third movement to it. It has all three of these movements. Verse 5, Psalm 13, verse 5 says, But, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. But I have trusted in your steadfast love, verse 5. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Verse 6. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. All of a sudden things begin to pivot. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Verse 6. And I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now we come to the third kind of prayer. It's praise. So we had protest, we had petition, and now we come to praise. Now the psalmist is ready to say, okay, I'm not going to live in this place of saying, Ugh, I'm going to eventually lift my head and say, all right, God, I know who you are, and because I know who you are, I'm going to lift up my song. C.S. Lewis said, praise is the completion of joy. When you're enjoying something, you can't help but praise it. You can't help but want to tell others about it. You're, you're, this is why we Instagram our, what we're eating, you know, because like, this is so good. i got to tell these random people who follow me what I ate today, you know. Oh, you're, you're experiencing something that you're enjoying, and you're like, this is it. I've got to tell others about it. I was enjoying worship so much, and it was so kind of the team to sing Overcome, a song from, that came out of our church written by one of my dearest friends. And I was taking a video of it because I'm going to send it to John later and be like, dude, we're singing Overcome today. You enjoy something, you want to share it, you want to praise it, you want to talk about it. Praise, in a very real sense, is the completion of joy. But that's not why the psalmist is praising in Psalm 13. 
This isn't one of those psalms that opens with, oh man, this is, life is so good, I'm just going to praise you. I just need to take a praise break right now. Psalm 13 is the psalmist saying, how long will you forget me forever, God? And then secondly, please don't let my enemies win. And then he, then he praises. You're like, okay, I'm not familiar with that kind of praise. I'm familiar with the praise when life is good. I'm familiar with praise as the completion of joy. But how do I praise in the midst of a difficult situation? That kind of praise requires faith. That kind of praise requires our eyes to be fixed on a greater reality. The psalmist said, you have dealt bountifully with me. That's the way the psalm ends, because you have dealt bountifully with me. What's he saying? I said, I, I'm so sorry. I just thought you said that God seems to be ignoring you. What do you mean he's dealt bountifully with you? The psalmist is saying, oh, no, I have a history with God. And my history with God is longer than this moment with God. Can I tell you something? Lord willing, you're going to have a lot of years ahead of you. But what you're developing right now is you're developing a history with God. And one day, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, you'll be, you'll be looking back and you'll say, gosh, this moment is not good, but God has been good in my life before. And I've marked these memorial stones and I've written in my journals and I've marked these moments in my life because one day I'm going to say, God, it sure seems like you're ignoring me, but you have dealt bountifully with me. You are developing a history with God right now. You're cultivating roots that will see you through difficult times. In fact, all through the Psalms, the psalmist praises God on the basis of what God has done. Sometimes we try to be too clever about this stuff, you know, and we're like, well, you know, hey, Glenn, you might praise God for what he's done, but I praise God for who he is. <laughs> like, well, actually, in the Bible, God shows who he is by what he does. It, repeatedly in the scripture, he, God reveals who he is by what he does. And that means when we look at what he's done, we say, I think I know the kind of God that you are. And because you're that kind of God, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to, I have confidence for my future because of what you've done in the past. And maybe you're here this morning and you're like, well, what has he done in my life in the past? Actually, my story's pretty lousy. I'll say, let's go farther back. How far back? How about 2,000 years back? And we look at the cross and we say, oh, yes, that. That is what the Lord has done. That he entered into space and time and human history and became a man and took on our sin upon himself, suffered with us and for us, so that even death will not be the end of your story. Can I say to you this morning that your life does not end with suffering and death, that your life ends with resurrection. At the end of your story will be resurrection and new creation. That with God as the author and the finisher, your story has a good beginning and a glorious ending. And that's why Psalm 13 may have started with protest, but it ends with praise. It's kind of a picture of our whole life. You might find yourself, I'm in the middle of this story, God, and all I got is protest. That's okay. Just remember that it's not going to end with protest. It's not even going to end with petition. The only one of these prayers that will still be worth praying or that, that, that we need to pray in the new creation world, the new heavens and the new earth, we won't be praying prayers of protest anymore. We won't be praying prayers of petition anymore because John tells us in Revelation 21 that one day every tear will be wiped away. Paul says death will be swallowed up by victory. Everything will be defeated and made new. And the only of these three prayers that we'll be praying then is the prayer of praise. Amen? That's the only one of these that remains. And so this morning is... Uh, Kevin comes to play uh, here. I want to invite us to actually test out these postures of prayer. Praise, the statement of praise is the language of praise teaches us to say, it will not always be this way. It will not always be this way. If, if, if protest is it should not be this way, and petition is come and make a way. Praise, the language of praise teaches us to say, it will not always be this way. It will not always be this way. So would you stand with me this morning? I want to invite you just to take a few moments.
and maybe do something physical with each of these prayers. Maybe you're in a place and you're like, all I've got right now is protest. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to clench your fist. And let's all do this. Let's all work through all three of these. And so start here with protest. You can clench your fist, but lift them upward towards the Lord. And maybe just quietly say, think of a situation and say, God, it, this should not be. Maybe it's something in your own life. Maybe it's something you've experienced. Maybe it's something you're thinking about or observing. Just take a few seconds and quietly just say, God, this should not be. It should not be this way. And then I want you to put your hands together. You can either you know, lock your fingers or not, but now we're gonna move to the posture of petition. And maybe there's something you're praying about. Maybe it's about your future. Maybe it's about a situation. You could say, Jesus, come and make a way. Something you're facing. Just quietly where you are before God, just come and make a way, God. Come and make a way. Maybe it's someone you've been praying for, that they would come to know Jesus. Maybe it's a situation in your family. With your hands together, you say, come, Lord, make a way. And now the final one, if you just open up your hands, we're gonna do the posture of praise. You can lift them high, you can hold them out in front of you, whatever, but just open up your palms. It will not always be this way. Now, if you're comfortable with it, you could just with, with your own words, just say it out loud. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you're the Savior, that you're the Redeemer, that this is not the end, that it will not always be this way. Come, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Praise you, Lord. We lift up our praise to you, Lord. Jesus, I thank you for my sisters and brothers here in this room, watching online or watching later. I pray that you would always help us to orient our hearts toward you. In every turmoil and turbulence, every situation, that we would turn our hearts to you. Even if it is with the language of protest, let us take that to you. And even if it is with the language of petition, let us take that to you. But in the end, Lord, would you lift up our hearts and open up our lips to praise you, to remember who you are. Remember that we belong to you, that we are yours. So we give you thanks. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, GCU. Great to be with you today.